three scores and ten and even more. This is really a worthwhile life and of course, a life worth living by anybody who must have reached that stage. And of course, for such people who have crossed that area and have gone beyond that, they have become more or less for us repositories of knowledge and of course, warehouses of experience, if you like, and indeed, great mentors. Welcome to Reflections on Africa's largest TV network, the Nigerian Television Authority. Every week on this program, we scan through the Nigerian society and the people in search of people who have really made it in life, who have gone through these years and have seen Nigeria, touched Nigeria, felt Nigeria. And this is with a view to trying to tap from their wealth of experience and gain the knowledge they've got, or rather extract from the knowledge they've gotten in order to make us, me and you watching this program, sit tight and prepare for a better tomorrow. My name is Yusuf Nadabu Usman. My personality this week is alleged Dr. Ahmed Haman Joda. Say welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Ahmed Joda was born in 1930 in Giri in the then Adamawa province. He had his Arabic and Quranic education in Sugu and Yola town. He attended Yola Elementary School between 1939 and 1942, Yola Middle School from 1942 to 1945, and the famous Kaduna College, now Mbarewa College, between 1945 and 1949. Ahmed Joda proceeded to the School of Agriculture, Moab Plantation in Ibadan in 1949 for a course in agriculture. After completion, he was posted to Yola, where he stayed briefly before joining the Nigerian Citizen, a newspaper published by Gastia Corporation, publishers of the famous Gastia Tafikobo in Kaduna, as a reporter. In 1952, he secured a scholarship to study journalism in London, where he was opportuned to package a report on the Queen's visit to Nigeria. Ahmed Joda returned home and continued as a journalist at the then Northern Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation, later Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation and Radio Nigeria as regional editor. This experience took him through to the Department of Information as Assistant Secretary chief information officer and later permanent secretary. From information ministry, he was transferred to education and later the Ministry of Industries, where he retired on the 31st day of March, 1978. Ahmed Judas post-retirement years were really busy. While overseeing his farm in Yola, the Benue Valley Farms, he chaired the board of SCOA, one of Nigeria's largest business conglomerates then for 18 years. Ahmed also chaired George Winfrey Nigeria Limited and the Dish Bangkok Nigeria Limited for almost the same period. He was a board member of the Nigerian Flour Mills and Umaruko Nigeria Limited. Ahmed Joda was honored by the Nigerian government in 1965 with the merit of the Officer of the Federal Republic, OFR, and Commander of the Niger CON in 1979. At the international level, the French government honored him with Chevalier de la Ordre Nationale du Mérite. He also has a protocol award of doctorate degree from the University of My Degree. He was a two-time chairman of Nigeria's Transition Committee. Ahmed Hamman Joda had one wife, Aisha, whom he stayed with for 44 years before her demise. With her, he has four children and five grandchildren. Ahmed Joda is one of Nigeria's most successful and accomplished public servants an industrial and commercial stalwart, an international businessman, a farmer of repute, and indeed, an elder statesman. He is 90 and lives in Kaduna and Yola. Let me start from where it's, it counts so much to me. How do you feel at 90, sir? Well, I feel the same as I have felt in the last few years. I thank God I enjoy reasonably good health and I move around and I follow events. 
and uh, I live a normal life. The day before I was 90 or the day after I was 90, I feel more or less the same. I have the same concerns, the same feelings, and the same hopes as I have always entertained. Truly speaking, what's the secret, if I may ask? People ask me about what is the secret. I don't have any secrets. I continue to behave the same way I have felt for many years past. Of course, my feelings and expectations change with the time because this world is moving, yeah. is changing all the time. I try to adapt. But uh, you see, growing up to a grand old age, I don't think anyone can plan it and direct it. And I think it is the way that God has made it. People tell me, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't do that, do that. I eat whatever I get. I have no discrimination. I don't indulge too much in sugary foods because I've not grown up eating candies and enjoying sugar. In fact, I got to know what is sugar when I was at the age of 11, when I finished my first fasting the whole day. And my mother told my father, look, he has completed his fast today. And my father said, come to my room. I came to his room and he gave me a lump of sugar. I had never known it. He asked me to break my fast with it and I did. I didn't like it. You didn't like the sugar? That I have uh, restrained myself from eating it, not on medical advice, mm -hmm. but because I didn't grow up not liking it. But other things I eat, I eat red meat, I eat goat meat, I eat chicken, I eat fish, and uh, wherever I go, I find that I like the food I eat. It. Let's look at your health, therefore. Oh, there are so many things that you know come along with grand age, yes. um, diabetes, yes. high blood pressure, yes. and just to name the most important ones that come along with that. I don't know. I have both. You have both. And I have had them for more than 40 years. You've and been managing have, them. And I have uh, not spent a day in hospital because of any of these diseases. That's interesting. How are you able to manage it? Well, I go for medical checkups right. every year. And about 30 years ago, I was diagnosed as diabetic. A little bit later, as hypertensive, I got to check up annually. And the doctors find out what my status is. They prescribe medicines which I take. And they have, the medicines have worked. I don't think it's a secret. It's a development in my life which has been managed rather well. Well, you should be an extremely disciplined personality, I believe, because um, as people grow up with this kind of ailment, sometimes you find them become resistant to advices, to even medications and the rest of them. Um, that discipline, if I may just hammer on it a little, was it from home or how did you acquire it? Because when you said you were given a sugar and you just don't like the test at that age, 11 or 12, is, well, I mean, told, was it the coming up? I've told you I've never liked sugar. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> in Yola, when I was growing up, people put a lot of salt in their food. I didn't like it also. So I've never liked too much sugar. And uh, 
So I maintain no more sugar, no more, no sugar, uh, enough, just enough salt, not in excess. And it has worked for me. What about exercises? When I was still a civil servant, I used to play squash. But all my life, and especially since my retirement, I've been a very active person. I travel a lot. I go up. I used to work in Lagos in the 23-story building. <coughs> the list never worked. And I used to go up and down, no worries at all. And uh, as a retired person, I spent a lot of my time on the farm. That means walking around, going from one part of the farm to the other. A lot of it is unmotorable. So I do that every day when I'm home. Let's get down to Benue Valley Farms in Yola. <laughs> We've gone around this farm, we've seen it. It's really amazing. And uh, the most amazing thing to me is you. Four scores and ten, ninety. Look at how far we've gone. Look at how far you're still going. When did you come to this farm every day? Let's have your 24 hours. I leave my house mm. at quarter to six. In the morning. In the morning. Mm. To witness the feeding and the milking of the cows. The farm is divided into several sections mm -hmm. with animals and other activities. Here, mm. we are in the nursery where we raise tree plants mm. that we plant, we plant around the thing. Mm. And the trees we plant are not ordinary trees. Okay. They are the trees, the whole provides leaves which are good animal feed mm -hmm. with high protein content and we use the the trees to do our building work our sheds and so on and we also protect uh, we shield our buildings mm -hmm. and animals and people mm -hmm. from wind damage now when you come here quarter to six or five thirty or there about in the morning, mm. how long do you stay on this farm before you go back home? Or do you spend the whole day here? No, 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 no. Right. I spend two and a half hours. Okay, quarter to six to around eight. Eight thirty. Eight thirty. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly interested in their health. Mm -hmm. That if there is an animal that is sick that you can detect by the eye, we do that. And uh, we, I receive reports from the various herdsmen, okay. that if there are an animal that is lazy today, that has not eaten or has uh, tears coming out of his mouth or is uh, coughing, mm -hmm. any sign of illness, then we do what we can. But as soon as we detect that the animal is sick and it is not getting better, we don't waste time. We get rid of it. By slaughtering. We sell it. We sell it out. Yeah. Now, with this kind of uh, arrangement, you go home by 8, 8.30. Yes. Mm -hmm. What time do you come back again? Now, I go back, I have my breakfast about 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is anything to write, mm -hmm. I write. I have another farm. I visit. Where is the other farm? It's mm -hmm. on the other side of the town. Okay. It's about 40 kilometers from okay. here. This still Benue Valley Farms? It's Benue Valley Farm. Right. But I have all the sheep there and some fish. Okay. And um, do you come here in the evenings? Yes, I come here in what the time evening. Do you come every here in the evening? Four o'clock in the afternoon. And how long do you stay four, here? Four to evening? six. Four to six. Yeah. Now in the morning you come to check the animals, they are, mm. how they spend the night mm. and their mm. well being. Mm. In the evening, what do you do? Well, I do virtually the same thing in reverse. What happens to our animals mm. is that the animal, we expect it to produce, to give birth at least once a year. Mm. 
Okay. We expect to get milk from it. Hmm? And you get, expect to get other benefits. Mm. How do you get those benefits? Okay. So by, if they go, they spend the day looking for what to eat mm. and looking for where to drink water. But much of the energy they use to get that food and water will be used to get it. Yeah. But that at the expense of giving birth or producing more milk or growing faster yeah. and put more weight. Mm -hmm. So now the cattle I showed you, they are stationary, they are not going out. They'll spend all their time under shade, which is cleaned every day. And they will be given the food. We are, we are virtually self-sufficient in food. Mm -hmm. We are self-sufficient in water. Mm -hmm. And we are growing our, uh, and improving our management skills. Only sheep, yeah. Only sheep. Mm -hmm. They look all local. Mm -hmm. Yeah, local. Why? Huh? I think they are the best for this climate. Okay. And we've tried uh, the Balami and the Uda from Bono. They find that uh, these ones do much better. They are much better in this climate and in this environment. And people watching this program think that this is a right presumption or assumption about you, uh, Dr. Ahmed Joda, that as a fly animal, you don't want to get out of the land, you don't want to get out of tortured animals, mm -hmm. and you don't want to really get out of tortured anything nature. Or natural? Well, I don't know whether if I was not born Fulani mm. and I was born something else, whether I would not have uh, been what I am now. <laughs> uh, but when I was growing up, my parents had uh, some cattle. Right both my mother and my father's side. Mm. And when they died, I inherited some cattle. Mm. When I was going to school, when I was on holiday, mm. I go to the, our villages of indigenship mm -hmm. in the Maruo area in Giri. Mm. And I used to go and herd cattle. Mm. I used to go and till the land. Mm. <clears throat> I never forgot that. Mm. One, <clears throat> when we were in primary school here in Yola, right. <clears throat> we had a school farm mm -hmm. where we grew some things like guinea corn, like groundnuts mm. and things. The same thing when we were in the middle school in Yola. Okay. In Barewa, one classmate friend of mine, Levan Chiroma, who is now late, <coughs> we once produced enough potatoes mm -hmm. to feed the whole school wow. afternoon. And we were very proud of it, yes. In mm -hmm. the school farm? Yes, yeah, we had a plot okay. in, in, in my dormitory and Liman joined me mm -hmm. and we cultivated it. Mm -hmm. We produced the potatoes. We didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> when the principal saw it, yeah. he said, well, well, we, we bought it. Mm -hmm. He bought it. We paid, we asked some money. And he gave you the money? Yes. Mm -hmm. I went to the School of Agriculture mm -hmm. in Ibadan. Right. <clears throat> Not because I had planned to go there. Mm. When we finished taking our school certificate, our principal, mm. mm. <laughs> so he came and said, he wanted to know what career each one of us 
would like to pass you after we leave the college. So you can help to place us. Okay. I didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> okay. All I knew, I didn't want to be a teacher, mm -hmm. which I knew the principal wanted everybody to be. Mm -hmm. So when he asked me, it, when it was my turn, he asked me. So I said, look, I don't know what I want to do. I want to, you to advise me okay. what, you, what I should do. And he reflected for a short time. And he said, look, last night I had dinner with the principal of the School of Agriculture, Mo Plantation, Ibadan. They are looking for northern boys. They have no northern boys. Okay. Would you like to go? I jumped at the idea. And that's how I went to study agriculture in Ibadan. Were you the first northerners in that school of agriculture in Ibadan? I was not. <coughs> mm -hmm. Because you were saying well, there the, were no the, northerners. Maybe there were no plenty of But that is what he said. That was what he said. Mm. But. Uh, Maybe he just wanted but to. But in our it. class, mm. another boy from Kano, also, when I got the, when they took me, he also applied and got in. Mm -hmm. So we became the first two to be employed and posted. Okay. So there were two of us in my class. Mm -hmm. When we went to Ibadan, there were two other northerners. Okay. One from Bonu, one from Bida. Mm -hmm. But they were doing not the junior course. Okay. They were doing the senior course. They were there before you. They were. They had been students in Summer Rosaria. Okay. They had finished and they had worked, mm -hmm. and they were doing the senior course. Okay. So I found them there. Mm -hmm. So there were four of us in the school. Okay. Then when I finished, mm. I was posted to Kofare in Yola. Kufari back in Yola here. Yeah. How long did you stay there in Ibadan? Three years. Three years? Yeah. Were you on government payroll then? I was a full paid employee as, a, as well as being a student. I was being paid full salary. In which ministry were you then? No, I was in the School of Agriculture. So you say you were being paid salary? Yes. And the you were uh, employed as a technical uh, assistant. Mm -hmm. And we were sent to school. Mm -hmm. it is, there were no ministries. It was that Department of Agriculture. Okay, okay. So, and uh, the system was, you became an employee as a student. Mm -hmm. You live an independent life, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you carry out your studies. Mm -hmm. And I'm still interested in that agri school of agriculture because mm -hmm. we're on the farm, mm -hmm. and it seems like uh, almost everything that is being done here mm -hmm. has a root in that school. Mm -hmm. um, in Ibadan, mm. what specifically were you taught that is so much different from what is being taught now in schools of agriculture? Okay. The difference between mm. Ibadan, mm. Ibadan being in the southern zone mm. with much heavier rainfall, okay. much more humidity, mm -hmm. they concentrated more mm -hmm. on southern crops okay. like cocoa, oh, yeah. palm oil, mm -hmm. rubber, mm -hmm. timber, mm -hmm. uh, plantain, banana, mm -hmm. yams, mm -hmm. uh, moise, cocoa yam. And they also had animals. Mm -hmm. But the problem with having animals in the south of Nigeria then was that there were the other flies. Okay. So they had cows. But the cows have to be indoors and have to be completely isolated mm -hmm. and prevent uh, no insects will go there. Okay. We had pigs, we have sheep, we had goats, we have poultry, mm -hmm. and we, we studied those things. We did study things like groundnut and cotton mm -hmm. and guinea corn and rice. But why you spend 10 hours studying about cocoa tree? Mm -hmm. You spend, you spend one or two hours okay. to learn about cotton. Okay. And granite, for instance. Yeah. Okay. 
What is the most memorable thing you can remember mm. in Ibadan? Yeah. Some the turning point. The most memorable thing mm. was what happened to me on the first day of my arrival. In Ibadan? In Ibadan. We arrived by train. Mm -hmm. And we arrived the campus about 1 a.m. Mm. And we were allocated our rooms. Mm. There was just one room. And behind each room, there was a kitchen. Okay. There was nothing else. Mm -hmm. So, but when I was in Bareva Secondary School, mm -hmm. I was a scout. Mm -hmm. I had taken the precaution to come with a mat, okay. with a pillow, mm -hmm. with a bed sheet, mm -hmm. with mosquito net, mm -hmm. with spoon and with the uh, cooking pot. Okay. So I was ready to be independent. I knew how to cook. Okay. Now, but when I woke up in the morning, mm. I wanted breakfast, and I went to look for breakfast. You thought you would cook? And, and no, to go buy the breakfast and eat. Mm. So I went to where people were buying breakfast. Mm. And uh, <coughs> I found them selling what they call pap okay. and Accra. Mm -hmm. But we looked like Gosei okay. and Kunu. Okay. So I bought them. But when I ate the Accra, I had a shock. Right. What did you see? Something, you something see? went bang in my mouth. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was. And I stood still, and the boys, my mates, saw that there was a problem. They asked me, I said, I, had, I think I have a scorpion in my mouth. And they laughed and said, how silly are you? How can you have, open your mouth? Mm -hmm. When they opened the mouth, bro, they said, bring out the, the, the what is in your mouth. I brought it. The so there was a big pepper. Red hot pepper, okay. which went into my mouth. At that time in Yola, people did not know what pepper is. We didn't eat pepper. Right. <coughs> so that was what I remember most. <laughs> but about school life, yeah. it was the same routine. You wake up in the morning at 6 o'clock, mm -hmm. go and do whatever assignment, which in our own case at that time was to, to sweep the, the pig house or to milk the cows, or to clean the, uh, the poultry house, or your, or your plot of land near your hut, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, go to class after breakfast, lunch, dinner, in the evening. Of course, I had uh, escapades. Mm -hmm. I, when I was able to buy a bicycle. A bicycle would, in, uh, in Biden or? Yes. Or? And I used to go to cinema at night. Mm -hmm. When I come back, I have no light on my bicycle. Mm -hmm. I have no bell. My brakes were bad. <laughs> and the local police mm -hmm. were on the lookout. Mm -hmm. And we used to, that to begin with, we used to have a lot of argument. And they say, you house a boy, go. So they let me go, and in the they be, became friends. Okay, with them. When when I was living in Baden, mm. they gave me a party. The police. Wow, mm. that's great. That's beautiful. <laughs> in case you are just joining us, the program is Reflections, and we are reaching you from Africa's largest TV network and that is the Nigerian Television Authority. I have been discussing with Elijah Ahmed Joda, uh, many times permanent secretary, and of course, a personality of repute, who, as far as Nigeria is concerned at the moment, had very few, or rather has very few of his contemporaries. He is 90 years old. <laughs> Let's look at your life now. Let's get down to the nitty gritties of this program and then see who Amit Joda has been and then uh, what really happened in his life. Uh, 
Mm. There should be some memories in your life that you will never forget. Mm. Let's start from the Quranic schools. Mm. Both my father mm. and my mother were learning in the Islamic religion and in the Arabic traditions. Mm -hmm. And they were both teachers. Mm -hmm. They taught a lot of children from around. My father was a local government worker. Okay. But uh, he combined that with teaching other children. Mm -hmm. My mother was more or less, beside being a housewife and mother, <coughs> was a teacher to many children. Mm -hmm. So, to start with, I think about age three, mm -hmm. she was started teaching me. Okay. But she was a very harsh, non-nonsense person. Mm -hmm. And we lived with my grandmother, who was a very kind, loving person, mm -hmm. and who loved me mm -hmm. more than anything else in the world. My grandmother could not tolerate the way my mother was beating me up and caging me all the time. It was more or less a crisis. So it was decided that if my mother cannot teach me, my stepmother, who was also a teacher, should. I went to her. But she was so loving so kind, she wouldn't hurt a fly. And I think probably I was naughty. My, so my parents decided that between my stepmother and my grandmother, I would be a spoiled child. So they took me to a house of Malam. We were living in a place called Tongo. Yeah. Street. Yes, right. it's a local government headquarters now. And uh, they took me to a school teacher, a house of person, I think five miles north of where we lived. And I was to learn my Arabic and uh, Islamic knowledge there. In his house, the language spoken was house, and I didn't speak it. Outside, the children with whom I would be playing were either houses speaking, no Fulani speaking. They were speaking a language called Chamba. Okay. And I didn't, you didn't know, they how didn't to know speak it. That. Hmm. So, this was a bit confusing for me. Yeah. And uh, as I was managing to understand the situation, I fell sick. The news got to my grandmother, and she, she got up in the morning before anybody, before anybody woke up in the house and walked to the place called Sugu. And I had fully recovered by the time she came, but she wouldn't leave me. She took me back. And uh, I was, another teacher was found for me. And I was getting in and out of trouble. Still in that same um, locality? No, or in the back, back in at Tumble? home. I was living at home, but going to the school next door. Okay. And I was continuing to learn. My father was transferred to a place called Michika, the opposite end in the north mm -hmm. of Adamawa. Mm -hmm. I continued with my Islamic and Arabic education. Mm -hmm. Then my father was transferred to Song. And she decided that we will now settle in Yola instead of moving around with us. And uh, <clears throat> while I was doing my Arabic studies under a woman called Inna Jangirde. In Yola? In Yola. Right. While your father was working in song then? Yes. Right. And uh, so. One, one day my father came, visited the Galadima Aminu of Adamawa then, came back and announced that I had been enrolled to go to the elementary school 
תולם דיבוקו. It was a weighty announcement. It was the gathering of the family, my father, my mother, my grandmother, all the, all the children, and all the relations. It was a fairly big house. Was it, um, was it uh, like an announcement, a big one that everybody yes. has to be part it, of? It, it was an announcement. It, it, it wasn't organized to be announced like that, but it happened that we were all gathered under the same tree, under the shade of a tree. Right. And he came in and made the announcement. I liked the idea, but it was a booted welcome to the rest of the family. No more, nobody made any comments. So the following day I was in the primary school. If I should and, ask, and I why, why, didn't, why didn't they comment on that? Because I we cannot, you know, then when we say Western you know, education you people... Know, the felt, time we were talking about mm. was 19... 39. There were not many people going to school. There was only one primary elementary school in Yola for the whole population. And there was none for miles and miles away. And anyway, there was always the fear that as a Muslim, you go to the European school, you will cease to be a Muslim. You will probably become a Christian. I think that weighed very much on their minds. But the fact that the Galadima Adama had personally said I should go to school made them not object openly. I think my father liked the idea. I went to school and I liked it. Well, your father was learned. Mm -hmm. Yes. He was even a local, yes. local government yes. or native authority right. yes. worker there. He was like the local government secretary. Right, right. Mm. So I went to school. But I think because of the foundation I had in reading and writing Arabic and uh, the discipline of going to school, listening to people teaching you, gave me an edge to the rest of, I was nine years old. It gave me an edge. So I was doing very well in school. At the end of my, toward the end of my second year, I was moved from class two to class three. Okay. So you jumped the class. And along with two others. Right. And we went, it was, a little bit of a difficult time. For two or three weeks, I didn't know where I was. But I recovered okay. and went to elementary four. Now, something happened to me in elementary four. Toward the end of the year, I had a swollen knee. The swelling moved up to my thigh and up to my foot. Very well swollen and so on, and very painful. I missed school for more than a month. And I had a native operation, which was brutal. Native operation, brutal. Mm -hmm. How do you mean? A relation of ours came from the village, saw me. And so after examining me, she said, well, <coughs> she would do something about it. And by tomorrow she will come back. But in the meantime, they should get some, some better fat from fat from the meat, cow meat, but the fat. The suit, you know what is suit? Yeah. And some pepper. And the pepper and the suit should be ground and uh, put on in the paste. It may turn into a place with this butter. So she came back the following morning, gathered some logs, put, we had about six or seven knives, put them in the fire, which she was blowing. And when these knives became hot, red, red and then white, and when she brought this, I realized what was about to happen. 
and the whole house was gathered. And when the, she was ready, she said some two or three people should hold me. And I decided that this was going to be a painful operation. And that the one thing that I will not do will be to cry. With the pain. Hmm? I think I was 12 years old at the time. Right. So they held me and she would bring this knife out. Mm. I think you can see some scars. Yeah, there's scars here. Yeah, 13 of them. 13. 13. Yeah. On the lake. Yeah. She would pierce it with this hot fire. Mm. And as she pierces it, it opens. Mm. You know, the flesh. When you take, cut the skin and oozing out, it looks like a little ball, mm. a little grain. Mm. It is white, but then it's covered with blood. I was looking at this. And she would put this paste of pepper and fat of fat and sweet inside and said, this is the disease that she is killing. By the third round, <coughs> everybody had disappeared. I was left with the woman who was carrying out the operation. She finished the operation, brought hot water and leaves, washed the wound, and covered it with butter fat, and said they should take me to the bedroom. And it was very painful. Okay. And within two or three days, <coughs> I was well enough to get out of bed and begin to learn to walk. The swelling had gone down. Mm -hmm. I could still feel pain. Yeah. And it was still difficult. Mm -hmm. So one morning I felt well enough to return to school. <clears throat> and school was about three or four kilometers. You have to try away. I had to trek. I arrived. I entered the class. All my mates were seated. And there were three men. Very tall. Very neat. And well dressed. They certainly looked like people, men in authority. Okay. I knew one of them mm -hmm. who was the headmaster of my school. Okay. The other I learned later or the visiting teacher, like inspectors of education. Oh, right. So when I came, they were talking behind the class. <clears throat> and as I entered, they stopped talking. And the headmaster said, oh, well, here he is. Okay. Apparently, they were discussing me. That is a pity I was not there to take the entrance examination. He then said, I think we should let him take the exam. Because okay. they say I should take, take my seat. Take, you sit down, take the exam. I didn't know what it was all about. <clears throat> A few days later, they said I had been selected to go to the middle school, which is the next step towards going to secondary school. Middle school was boarding. But life changed. <clears throat> but one striking thing is you said most of you were full and you speak, which means there were no many students or students from other communities outside the other. Yes, but the, the difference school. in the middle school mm. was that many other languages were spoken. So by the time you got to the middle school, mm. you enter what you call remove class. In other words, is neither, it's not in the system, but it's a special class made to teach you the English language. And the only other subject was arithmetic. Okay. So that in that one year, you learn English, which is now used in the second, in the middle one and middle two, to teach you all the other subjects. Okay. So you stop speaking Hausa, you start speaking English. English. Okay. And when you spend the remove class, you go to primary, you go to middle one, middle two, 
then a select number. Uh, in our case, they selected seven of us to take the common entrance examination to Kaduna College, now called Barewa College. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so we went through that. On what, what basis was the selection made? There was every, uh, there was the usual ex end of term examination. Right. There was the end of year examination. Right. And I think using those records, mm -hmm. They selected seven of us okay. to take the common entrance examination, okay. which we took. Okay. Now, <clears throat> at that point in time, I was becoming unmanageable, both in the classroom mm -hmm. and in the hostel. How do you mean unmanageable? Were you becoming... I was beginning to challenge the authority of my teachers and my prefects. You know, li like in the hostel, it was usual and acceptable that the senior boy, the prefect, will give you his clothes to go and wash for him. Yeah. And I found that I didn't want to do that. And uh, it was punishable. Yeah. So we used to have a roll call every day at 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. before go going to bed. Mm -hmm. And if there was any issues, anybody who has misbehaved, it was a semicircle. Mm -hmm. So you come into the center circle mm -hmm. and you will be awarded, you will be tried if found guilty you are given three or four or 12 knocks. On the head. That was like a court. Now who was presiding over the court? The prefect. The, prefect. the man the to whom I offended. I was sitting down like that. And by, because my offense was so grave, they decided that there was nobody who can give me that punishment. Enough hard knock. They got somebody from another hostel called Umaru Daka because he was a specialist in doing <laughs> and he was a giant. Right. And we called him the useless giant. Well, well you are not that big then, I looking at your okay. statue, you are very tiny, I believe. Right. So they the most they, they called him. Mm. And he was coming, he was happy that he had an assignment. He was jumping into the air and shouting and saying that he'll kill everything on his way. <laughs> so he came, entered there, and they said, okay, give him 12. He jumped. And I realized that if he knocked me, I may have been finished. So I- He was tall and big, but he had to jump, jump again, again in order to reach uh, you yes. as tiny as you were. So I, as he was about to come down, mm. I decided I would not wait. Mm. I jumped out of the circle <laughs> and disappeared from the school. Right. And he fell down. And uh, I don't know how badly he was hurt or something because he was coming with full force to knock me and I was not there. Mm. I went to one of my teacher's house. I leave my Borno. Mm -hmm. I was one of his favorites. Right. And I was also a favorite of his wife. So they shielded me for the night. But before they woke up the following morning, I ran away from school. Why did you go to I went home. When I arrived, they didn't ask me any question. They realized that something was wrong. And they got somebody to take me back to school and hand me back to the headmaster. So I was taken back to school, to the headmaster's office. But you see, when I disappeared, there was commotion in the school that had disappeared. Nobody knew how I had gone. So there was a lot of concern, both in the hostel and in the teacher and the head headmaster and the teachers. So when I came, they were very yeah. thankful. They forgot. Yeah. And, and so I, I resumed classes. We had taken the common entrance exam to Kaduna. The results had come out weeks before. 
I had been given an unconditional admission into Kaduna College. Two of my other mates had been given provisional admission because they were to start double stream. Uh, their condition for admission was that if the new classroom had been built. So we were waiting for that. So I was sitting down in the classroom. From the window, I could see the headmaster's office. Uh, for some reason, I was putting my eyes on it. <coughs> so suddenly, I saw the headmaster come out. The, uh, the, the class teacher entered our class just before the headmaster arrived. And I concluded that he was coming to announce that at least why I is leaving the school to go to secondary school in Kaduna. And uh, I packed my books, I was holding them. So he came in, greeted the teacher, they greeted, and then he said, why are those three good boys? Then, uh, you are not mentioned, your name was not mentioned. No, How do you know your group? because I was number one anyway. <laughs> okay. I, under any circumstances, I would go. All right. But when he asked for the three good boys, mm. we, I, I jumped out. The others were sitting down. He said, I asked them to get up. Mm. So. He said, follow me. Okay. So that meant that I had escaped punishment from the teacher. So we went to the class, and he made his little speech, and he gave us some money to... to by that time, my father was teaching in Mahabalwa mm -hmm. uh, to go, to go, and uh, so, so when, when we, he said we were given five days, and that we should come back to the school on the fifth day to take the lorry to Kaduna. One of us was a city boy, Mohammed Kiari from Jimeta. The other one, Mohammed Yahaya, who we were also came from Mahabalwa. So <coughs> the Mohammed Kiari said, OK, we should now go and pack our things. And, uh, but we should wait after classes. We eat lunch. And uh, we say goodbye to our friends in the school. I say, look, I have no friend in this school. <laughs> I'm going now. Muhammad Yaya supported him. So we were to go together. So I said, look, I'm leaving. But I'll wait for you under that tree. It was, you know where the Army Barracks Road starts now. I'll wait for you there. If you don't come in one hour, I will leave. Raja Ahmed Joda, we thank you so much for being with us. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, for the past uh, 40, 45, 15 minutes, we've been talking to Raja Ahmed Joda here. And then um, we've talked so much about uh, his life and uh, how he impacted on Nigeria and Nigeria generally. Um, this program will not be very much conclusive. We shall look for another time order to continue with it and if need be, have some more and much more information uh, out of uh, Alaji Ahmed Joda's uh, live story. Thank you so much for watching. See you again next time. Mm -hmm.